was finding a lot of my costs over the last year, like the insurance costs went way up for all my properties. And so when you subtract all this down, I was netting like $950 a month. And I said, if I put that 300 K in at 10%, it's 2,500 a month. Like, Welcome back to Women Creating Wealth. You know, sometimes you just have to hear me like harping on and telling you stuff. But today we have a special guest, Nancy McKenna. She's awesome. I love her already. We've only been talking for about three minutes and I already think she's fantastic. She is a money coach. She's got a passion for transforming the lives of single midlife women by helping them to attain true financial freedom and independence. With more than 35 years of experience as a corporate accountant and 17 years as a successful real estate investor, Nancy brings a wealth of knowledge and practical expertise to her clients and to us. Nancy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm psyched. So Nancy, when you talk about, I mean, I guess I highlighted that and maybe it didn't need to be highlighted, but the, the idea of true financial independence and financial freedom, what does that really mean? Well, you replace your W-2 income with streams of passive income. And as someone who knew she was never going to get a pension, I decided that real estate was going to be my ticket to financial independence. So when I, I decided I had two kids on my own, so I was responsible not only for me, but for two kids. And I wanted to make sure they had a decent life and could have a college fund and all the things. So I started reading up on real estate. And... I had a couple of colleagues that were also real estate investors, although they did sort of different things. Like a friend of mine, he I used to work in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he left there after he was laid off. He moved back to upstate New York and started buying small apartment buildings. And he said his goal was to have 100 doors, and then he would pay them all off, and then he could do whatever he wanted. And I thought, wow, that sounds great. But no one would give me a loan to buy an apartment building because I had no experience. So mm -hmm. I started looking into buying real estate and my goal was to, I started at age 40. I was going to buy a house a year till I was 50, then spend the ages 50 to 60 paying them all off. And then I'd be done. And um, a few things happened in the interim, like the real estate market tanked in 2008. I had an unfortunate um, experience with low income housing and that, you know, sort of took me off the ball for a while, but I realized this is a mistake. I sold all those. And then I said, okay, my model is three bedroom, two bath homes built in the last 20 years. But because I lived in high real estate cost areas, I never owned real estate near where I lived. Yeah. They were always in other states. And I just used property managers and people thought I was crazy. I'm like, I haven't even been inside most of them. <laughs> and, but it, it worked for me. I'm like, I really don't want to be in the business of managing them and collecting rent and screening tenants. So, so that worked for me. And I did eventually hit the 10 home goal, not as quickly as I had hoped, but I did, I did hit it. So is it still your goal? This is like a whole separate, you know, potential, you know, wormhole, but is it still your goal to pay those off and just? Well, I've actually taken a different turn and I'm selling all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And cool. the reason is I started doing my estate planning and the estate attorney said, well, what you need to do to protect all these homes and get them into your trust is to, you should set up LLCs in each of the states where your properties are and then have the trust own the LLCs. And I thought, I don't want to do that because, <laughs> you know, as a corporate accountant, I'm very familiar with governance and taxation and all of these things. And if you don't do those right, then there's no protection at all. It, you, yeah. The corporate veil can be pierced. And the other thing I started doing is the attorney said, well, why don't you make a list of all your assets and keep them with a binder? Because as a single woman, I mean, no one knows where my money is except me. Exactly. And um, so I started making a list. And again, my accounting background, I had an Excel schedule, a tab for each property, and I'm listing out property manager, HOA, property tax insurance. And I thought, that's a lot of stuff to hand over to someone who has no experience with real estate. Absolutely. So I still love real estate, but I am moving into what I'm calling real estate adjacent things. And um, 
I had rentals in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the market was really hot. So I said, I'm going to take some money off the table. And I sold one of those homes to Zillow, which was a dream experience. Really? And it was actually like one of the last homes I sold before they stopped doing that. <laughs> but, um, so I had, I was holding on to the money and I'm like, well, what do I do with this money? And I still wanted to do something with real estate. And I thought about hard money lending. And I thought, okay, well, how in the world am I going to find people that want to borrow it? And how do I vet them? And yeah, do that's hard. <laughs> it's hard. So a friend of mine who also is a real estate investor told me about this, this company in Las Vegas and it's called trust deed investing. So it's basically hard money lending, but they only work with people that have, they work with for 10 years that have long track records. So you can put as little as 10% into one of these and they, they go for nine months and as much as you want, I guess. But if sometimes if you put a hundred K or more into one of these particular loans, you get a higher interest rate mm -hmm. and it sounded too good to be true, but my friend had been doing it for over five years and I, I have all respect for him. He's a great money manager. So I started putting some money in and I put them into different trustees, not all in one. And you get a check every month, 10%. There's no cost. There's no vacancies. <laughs> there's mm -hmm. none of that. And I'm yeah. Okay. You never get a phone call. No one ever needs anything. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's, there's some, you know, hard money lending. The hard part about hard money lending for the lender is finding the right people. Yeah. You know, you want to hand it, the money to somebody who knows what they're doing, who has the experience, who's going to finish the project that they started. Right. I mean, yes. and, and who could weather a storm. The, the people right. who I know who do hard money lending, they, you know, it's a, sometimes a changing criteria. Like right now, they're, um, she told me they're only doing like um, what you call fluff and buff, right? So you, you fix and flip type of thing, a fluff and buff that doesn't need a ton of work only for people who they've worked with before or who have the experience, right? So you you have this you have this criteria and it's wonderful that you found people who already have that solid criteria, who yeah. already know the people that they're working with. And then it is, it, it, it does feel like this is just like crazy. This can't be true, right? It's got to be some kind of a Ponzi scheme, but it's I not. Know. It's just an, you're just an, you're a bank, right? That's how banks work. <laughs> That's right. And so each of these master loans, it can range from 2 million to, to 20 million. So you just have a small piece of it. And um, yeah, last condo I sold, I was talking with the realtor because he is also an investor. And he's like, why are you doing this? And I said, look, this condo I'm selling it was 300 grand say, and the rent was 1800 less property tax, less HOA, which had gone way up. I was finding a lot of my costs over the last year, like the insurance costs went way up for all my properties. And so when you subtract all those down, I was netting like $950 a month. And I said, if I put that 300 K in at 10%, it's 2,500 a month, like guaranteed. And he's yeah. looking like, wow. so a question I have is yeah. when you sold that doesn't count as a 1031 exchange, correct? I did not do that. No, I'm actually paying you the can't tax do on them. Yeah. And um, I'm very focused on my estate at this point because mostly because my mother just died and my sister and I are settling my mother's estate. And I, her estate should have been so simple and it is unbelievably complicated. So I'm trying to, you know, make, I just want to simplify my life. Yeah. And also, um, this is kind of sad, but my my son back there, he he died four years ago. And that was oh a my God. after a two and a half week illness, total shock, total oh devastation. So I'm trying to, you know, simplify my life. And um, and that's also the reason I stopped working. Luckily, I had been planting the seeds of this real estate all these years. So um that's something I like to stress to women is you never know what life's going to throw at you. Something I call the three D's it's, it's death, divorce, or disability. I mean, you probably know people that have been unable to work because they became ill or, you know, they lost a job and they couldn't find another one making nearly what they were making before. So it's really, really important to plan for these things that you cannot plan for. Yeah. And to keep and put to put things under your control. Yes. Control right? It's not even, that. you know, you think, oh, I've been with this company forever and I've got job security, that myth of job security. <laughs> Guess well, what? If it isn't your uh, company there, and sometimes even if it is your company, <laughs> there is no I, job security. And I had the fortune or misfortune of, of ending up in the tech world where I was, first of all, the oldest one in the room all the time, which was never fun. But those companies, they run out of money, they get acquired 
And that's what happened with my company. It was acquired. And then after a year, I wasn't, you know, their kind of person. And I'm like, okay, peace out. I'm done. <laughs> and I was able to do that because of real estate. Right. Exactly. And planning. Yeah. And there's no, I don't think you can underestimate. I think it's hard for people who have always worked yes. and, you know, are relying on that kind of constant paycheck type of thing that comes from outside of them that they might not even realize the feeling of like having all that stuff. You know what I mean? Like I, people who marry for money, right? I, I say to myself, I would never want to have to be nice to somebody just to keep a roof over my head. Right. And that's kind of what it's like to have a job. You know, you have to be like a certain, you can't be just like, you know what? I don't feel like going in today. Yeah. I'm just going to go to the beach. You know, it's pretty nice out. You know, life's too short. You know, that, that doesn't really work that well in the corporate environment. <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't. And Again, with the tech world, it is a little different because I was talking with my group of college friends and I'm like, oh, I hate always being the oldest one in the room. And they're looking at me like, what? And then I thought, oh, well, she's a court reporter. She's a social worker. She's a school teacher. They're not the oldest ones in there. It's just this avenue I ended up down. <laughs> so, well, you could be 30 and be the oldest person in the room in the tech right. world. You know? <laughs> That's actually one of the reasons I left California, the Bay Area, because it was very youth driven and my kids were small. And plus the price of houses I thought there is no way in the world my kids would ever be able to buy a house here and my daughter actually recently sent me a Zillow link to the little teeny tiny house we had 30 miles east of San Francisco 1.4 million and I said that's why we left because you know out there a lot of people have this false sense of oh I'm so wealthy because my house is worth something well that's only true if you sell the house yeah and you don't need to live anywhere else (laughs) what are your kids going to do they can't buy a house there it's just it's become like, like a third world. You've got all these ultra wealthy techie people and then everybody else. And yeah. Yeah. So my housing that I bought was mostly in the South. I think the South is the sort of the future. Everyone, like I live in New Jersey, you know, people move to the South because they don't want the winters anymore. And so Raleigh was a really good place. And I bought in Alabama. Florida has become very, very expensive, as you probably know. So I looked at it and I thought, uh, yeah, in Florida, you know, similar thing as far as like uh, squatters and, you know, just bad because you've got so many seasonal homes. Yeah. A lot of people just squatting and, you know, can't, people can't get them out. It's just messy, messy, messy. Yes. But anyway, <laughs> so much more fun when you're doing hard money lending. Yeah, that's <laughs> easy. And I also like REITs. Um, so I put my, I took my 401k money from my last company and rolled it into a self-directed IRA and put that into a REIT because I wanted exposure to commercial property. Yeah. But again, I don't think I know enough about it to invest in it. But so just getting back to REITs real quickly, the thing that I don't like as much about REITs, well, okay. The, the one that I was invested in, you could not get out until they sold the portfolio. Huh. So- you, you got in and then you just had to wait until they were ready. Like, okay, now we're going to sell it and now you can get your money back. So I didn't like that piece, but also a more traditional REIT, like um, one that I know a lot of my investor friends like is like NNN. <clears throat> and that they, ha- I think they're the ones who just do land. Okay. So they buy, they own the land that, uh, you know, a big box store is built on or something like that. But even at that, uh, a lot of these, th- the actual tax filing can be quite cumbersome. So having it in a 401k is, is a lot easier, <laughs> but do you, do you find any of those, have you you know discovered any of those shortcomings when you were looking well, at REITs? It hasn't been that long that I've been in it. It's been about a year. So I, yeah, I haven't had any bad experience yet. Um, but it's, I, I just like the idea of sort of having my money in different places. So yeah. you know, something will, I don't want to be all in on the stock market or all in on real estate. Yeah. I think mix is yeah, for good. sure. Well, and some people, I know <laughs> some people who invest in real estate, they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm in the stock market, but they're actually in a REIT. And you're like, you know, that's real estate, yeah. right? <laughs> Not actually diversity. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
But yeah, there's lots. That's why I like listening to podcasts and hearing what other people have to say about things and, you know, what else is out there. Right. One thing that I've just done is I put money down on a 55 plus home. It's on the Chesapeake Bay, which I grew up in Maryland and it's, I've always loved the water. And I was just looking at this going, this is like a fantastic resort. And I'm kind of young to be in a 55 plus place, but it's hard for me here because I don't work anymore and all of my friends still work. So I'm like, okay. Yeah. So I liked the fact that there's sort of a built-in community. So I'm buying it as a second home because I have severe anxiety about selling this home because my son grew up in it. And I, I, I have a lot of issues about that, but, oh, and I do like it here. It's, it's beautiful, you know, in this part of New Jersey out here in the country where I am, <laughs> yeah. but I don't love the winters or the spring. We don't seem to have spring. It seems to go from <laughs> winter to summer. So, yeah. So that's something. So, you know, I, I would own two homes and um, so that I still have my real estate. It won't produce income. Although I was thinking about it this morning, like, I wonder if I could do short-term rentals at that place. If that's allowed, you never yeah, know. Yeah, some, some a lot of places don't allow l- less right. than like three months or six months, you know, just to kind of get away from that transient feeling. Yeah. People and I like to know their neighbors and stuff. Right. Yeah. Cause I know in Florida, I was looking in the St. Petersburg area and a lot of them, and I thought it would be city by or property by property, like the HOA, but no, it's by city because, yeah, yeah the, and understandably, they don't want all these transients. And, yeah. And it can be both, you know, sometimes you'll be in a city that allows it, but that particular HOA doesn't. So. Oh, yes, that's true. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, it became so expensive there. The HOA fees alone and some of these condos were more than my mortgage and other places that I own. Oh, I, know. I thought they only I mean, over time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> I don't know. We don't need to talk about all the reasons I don't really care that much for Florida. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the cost alone. Um, yeah. But now, Nancy, when you, I, I, I want to talk about this a little bit because I think, you know, everybody who's listening has undoubtedly heard of real estate investing, is familiar with real estate investing, but is potentially not actually doing it themselves. Mm-hmm. It sounds like when you, you know, you're just like, okay, I need to make some money. I want this stability. I want this passive income stream. So I'm going to learn about real estate X, Y, Z. And then you just did it. Is that right. kind of the way it worked? Or did you have that's, any like well, that's exactly mental barriers? Right. I read a lot about it. And then I spent a lot of time thinking, where will I do this? Because again, I lived near San Francisco and it was obviously not yeah. tenable to do it there. So I actually, the first one I bought was I heard a commercial and it was for people like me. They wanted to invest in real estate, but they couldn't do it in California. So that was where I got the house in Portland. So this this company, they, they put you together with a realtor, a property manager, insurance, and they made it really easy. And they were mortgage lenders. That's how they got their money. Oh, okay. And um, so I bought that. And as I said, that same tenant, 14 years, I'm like, wow, this is easy. <laughs> and um, so I bought another one. And then somehow I went down that rabbit hole in low income housing. And it was just the people had no respect for the property. So every time a tenant turned, you had to like repaint and recarpet. And it was very expensive. And um I had a larcenous property manager and all this stuff. And it was just, I said, okay. But they were easy to sell because some other sucker thought they'd make money doing it. <laughs> so I sold those. And, the bigger and I, sucker. What's the, what's the thing? Yeah. <laughs> and then down to North Carolina, which has been, I've made a lot of money in Raleigh. So it's a long, long thing. So, you know, for the longest time, none of these properties seem to appreciate But then within the last couple of years, I mean, every, even though interest rates are through the roof, every place has appreciated so much. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because we were just talking about that a couple episodes ago about this idea that higher interest rates is going to make the property costs go down. And actually it doesn't really work that way when you're coming off of low rates, because if you've got a 3%, 2.5% rate, whether you want to upsize or downsize, are you going to sell that house and go, right? And go take a 6%, 7% loan? No, it's ridiculous. Like, oh, I'm downsizing, but my my payment's higher. Hmm, that exactly. doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So they're just going to do something, you know, just close up this half of the house or whatever, you know what I mean? It just, or they'll r- rent it or, you know, or just do something different because it just doesn't make sense. And who is going to build 
a, you know, a lower, a, a, a home that's going to be for an entry level person when material costs and labor costs, and now interest rates, you know, the cost of your money are so much higher. You can't build an entry level home. You've got to build a more luxurious home. So naturally the housing stock goes down, which supply and demand, right. the prices are going to have to go up. They are, they are. And I have the one house in Raleigh, the lease was originally up in March and the tenant begged me, they've been trying to buy a home. They said, please, can we have six more months? I'll give you an extra 250 a month. And I thought, oh, okay. So now those six months are up in September and they asked That's again. For extension. And I said, no, this time, because I'm buying that house of my own and I need the money to do that. So like you can buy this one that you've been living in for the last three or four years. Why not? You yeah. know, you like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we shall see. Yeah. Interesting. But now just kind of compare, if you would, mm -hmm. your life or your involvement in your real estate investing before when you own 10 properties and versus now where you're basically down to one property that isn't yours, right? Well, I always have used property managers, so yeah. it really was not a big effort on my part at all because I knew that A, I didn't know the real estate laws in all these different states, which change. Yeah. And, you know, again, I didn't want to have to screen tenants and I couldn't run over there to fix something. So really my direct involvement is not that different. Um, okay. Selling them remotely is challenging when you've got to turn on the gas and electricity and this and that. So uh, I had one in Missouri and I sold that to open door because Zillow no longer buys homes. And they're like, videotape the inside of the house. I'm like, well, no. you're <laughs> You videotaped the inside of the house. <laughs> and so I went to the property manager. I'm like, can I give you a hundred bucks to go over there? Like, you know, there's always an answer. There's always a way to solve a problem like that. And right. um, yeah, so so that was tricky. And I'm just glad that those are all done. So yeah, well, I think that's one of the most challenging aspects is finding people in all these locations. Right who you trust, who are going to do a good job, who aren't going to be coming up with repairs needed every month. Oh, look, right. you know, oh, it's only $500. It's only a thousand dollars this month. You need to just repair this thing. You're like, hmm. Yeah. I had one tenant, they were great payers, but every month it was something with them. And I finally told the property manager, cause they don't care. It's not their money, the property yeah. managers. Right. But I told them when rents had gone way up in Raleigh, I said, increase their rent up to market rate because they're costing me a lot of money in these repairs. Yeah. So um, yeah, that does, that does bother me. And because again, it's not their money. They don't care about it like you do. Or when there's a vacancy, they're maybe not as anxious to fill it as you would on your own Right. or even to sell it. Like my realtor in Maryland, he was a hustler. So the tenant moved out on a Thursday, he had an open house Sunday. And then we had like five offers by Wednesday. And this last one in North Carolina, I was asking about timing and the realtor said, well, within 30 days, we'll get it on the market. I said, wait, what? On the market. And he's like, well, we don't know what shape it's in. I'm like, I'm not, I've learned one thing I've learned is don't fix it up to sell it. Because even if you spend a couple of grand painting it or putting a new carpet, you put new carpet, they want hardwood, you know, whatever you do, it could be a complete waste of money. Right. So yes, clean it that I'm okay with, but don't do anything else. So what 30 days, what is that about? Right. I don't know if it's a Southern thing or what. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll work on that. So. so what would you say to people who are in this waffling space who are kind of, you know, throwing up, like this could have happened to you. You could have, you yes. could have said to yourself, oh, I'm in this area. I really can't buy investment property here because it's too expensive. Okay, never mind. Right? right. You you could have done that. That could have been like a barrier that you just weren't willing to push through. Right. What, what would you say to people who are allowing themselves to be distracted by little silly things that aren't really, you know, that are well, more excuses than reasons? Yeah. Well, I think the one thing is, as you I'm sure know, things will come up with the property. You will have vacancies. Um, so make sure you have enough cash lying around to cover if it's vacant or if something needs to be fixed. But other than that, I'd say take a deep breath and and just try it. And you can get advice from people who have gone before you. Um, but um, don't let it hold you back. Because my, my fear, the reason I chose real estate is I just thought, how can you possibly save enough money in 
the stock market, because you never know how long you're going to live, of course. But how can you, when you take money out of your accounts, it's gone. But with real estate, you get the income, but you still have the asset. And that was the thing that really spoke to me. So I will admit that the trust deed investing that I'm doing now, the money's not going to appreciate. That's why I'm not putting all of my money into it. Right. But it's a steady stream of income. So I'm trying to balance, you know, safety and security and, and income yeah. because, yeah. So I would just say, make sure you've done your research. I have a great little spreadsheet that I do that calculates. It's very simple, but it's in a columnar fashion, which you never find online. So you can say, if I'm buying a house for 300 and then you drop an HOA property tax insurance, and then you can play with it and say, well, if I put 10% down, if I put 20% down, if, the rent is this versus that. So you can see whether it's going to be profitable for you or not. And that gives me comfort because some people, honestly, they don't have any idea if the thing's profitable or not. And um, yes. so that's, you just have to understand. And I think my accounting background has given me a bit of an advantage there. And it's funny because different places I've worked. I've worked with people who are real estate investors and it's just a real, um, people love talking about it, right? It just lights you up. And and then one friend of mine, I remember at my last job, he had bought two places in Philadelphia and he was in New York. And he, then I spoke to him a year later and he had 17 doors because some of his were multifamily. Yeah. And, and then I speak to him two years later, he's got 23 and he's like, keep going, Nancy, keep going. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But his were all, so he turned me on to the guy in Alabama, actually, now that I think of it. But his properties, a lot of them are in Ohio. And I thought, I'm not doing the North Rust Belt kind of, <laughs> you know, I think the South is is a good place to go. So I would encourage people, pick smaller towns in the South. That would be my advice. Yeah, and just find a really good property. And there are things right. called turnkey properties, right? Well, they buy a house, they'll rehab it, they'll get it all really nice, right, everything's right. good get a, a tenant in there with a year or two lease. And then you, you're basically buying a, a complete package where yes, and I would, very I, likely things aren't going to go wrong. And, you know, yeah. And, and starter homes are generally the best as far as profitability because they're not crummy. So I would not invest in multifamilies because they tend to be in parts of towns that I don't love. So a small three bedroom, two bath house that's in, um, you know, within the last 20 years. So you'll have less maintenance yeah. and people like family, you get a family in because homes tend to have less turnover, as you know, than, than right. apartments and condos do, because you get families and they have kids in school and such. Right. Right. So you can look at school districts. There's all sorts of things you can look at before you make a decision. Um, but but the, talk to the property manager and say, what would this rent for? You know, yeah. so you can drop that into your schedule and do some analysis of your own. And that's the key right there is the analysis. Yes. Because as you said, some people don't know that whether or not their places are actually profitable. They've got these, you know, oh, look, this, this, the rent's 2,500. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's oh, nice. Right. What about on the other side? You know, well, yeah. Okay. And then you start doing the math. Like one of the people who I spoke to, she was a real, really intelligent woman and very, she, she enlightened me to, she said, I even like put down there the cost of my my corporate, you know, having a corporation or having what, however I hold that property, I amortize that, you know, every, every year, like if it's $500 and I thought to myself, $500, why would you bother? But right. you have to, right. Cause all those little $500 are going to add up yeah. and then you'll find out, Oh, you know what? I, I'm actually not making it, not just on paper. In reality, I'm actually not really making any money. And sometimes it's hard to tell because you've got that ebb and flow, you know, with, money coming and going and whatever. And, and you, uh, it, you, know, you, you might think, oh, I'm just a little light right now. But when you do the math, you're like, no, actually no, I'm getting lighter every month. <laughs> right. And, and that's a good point because I have a spreadsheet and I do very simple spreadsheets, but for my property. So there was a tab for each one. So you get the statement from the property manager and you drop all those in, but that's generally not all of your costs because some things you pay on your own, like the insurance, I would pay directly to the insurance company or you know, a repair. So I would like to put everything on one credit card and then I download the credit card activity every month. And so I would drop that into my PL because you don't want to miss an expense, as you say. Yeah. That's so smart. And you want to do that anyway, right? It's easier for right. taxes, keep everything right. nice and clean, Absolutely. have one credit card that's only for this property, this, yes. you know, scenario. Yeah. 
because it's easy to forget, especially when you're selling properties, you have to put deposits down on all of these utility companies in different states. And it's, it can, you know, it's a lot to uh, administer. So yeah, Absolutely. Not did you find me. anything when you were finding good property managers, how did you go about getting people who were, ended up being dependable? Well, I've only had one that I thought was really bad. And that was the one that didn't give me the money she collected from the tenants. <laughs> and, um, that was bad. Um, but in general, the one in Alabama was a referral from someone I knew and it respected. The other ones generally, um, there was that company I worked with and they would connect you to property managers. And, you know, I think, yeah, there were some, that there's things that you're never going to love about what they do. Um, and then you just have to be your own advocate and just because in you know, the squeak wheel gets the oil. If you keep emailing them or calling them, they will tend to you before someone who isn't complaining. Right. So you do have to pay attention. I will say that even though it's hands off and I have property managers, you do have to look at the statements. You do have to know what's going on because sometimes you find like tenants disappear in the night. And I remember one property manager she said, all that was left was a shoe in one of the rooms. <laughs> But that was the low income housing. And I heard later that there had been a shooting in the house next door. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, they probably so, left in the night, like, yeah, we don't want to stay here anymore. Wow, that's such a shame. But it's funny, these stories. Like a friend of mine that bought those small apartment buildings, it was in Syracuse. And he he was the owner, but he told them all the tenants he was the property manager. He didn't want them knowing he owned them. But he said he was watching the news one night and there was a bank robbery and the suspect was one of his tenants. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And okay, he had great. one of his units and, and, you know, all these funny things. Well, that's not funny, but um, during COVID though, he was kind of creamed because he wasn't able to evict people that weren't paying. And I was lucky throughout COVID. I never had any issues with, with tenants. Um, yeah, uh, that's a very, it was a kind of a unexpected and hopefully once in a lifetime type of scenario that was really tough on a lot of property owners. Yeah. But as far as property management, I don't go with an individual, go with a company because again, with the individual, that's where I ran into trouble. And also, I mean, people get sick or they have babies or, you know, whatever you want a company. So they have a team of people that will take care. Right. Of. I can't be like, Oh, I'm on vacation. I'm sorry. Right, we can't right. fix your problem right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, because that actually happened with me. Oh, actually, the guy in Maryland, he was an individual guy, but I had to replace the air conditioning unit and he was out of the country. So I had to, I had to do it, but yeah. it, that was tricky. Um, yeah. And you don't need that. Right? You say, if you want to, if it's hands off, I want to be hands off hundred percent. Right. <laughs> so Nancy, I love talking with you. I think the time is just like flown by. I think we could probably have a two hour conversation. Right. right. Um, what, what it, it, like in parting, what do you wish I would have asked you or what like p piece of wisdom do you want to share that we haven't touched on yet? Oh, well, I think, you know, as uh, I don't know if your audience is, is just women, but I think, you know, as a single midlife woman, I just want to make sure that women are taking control of their financial destinies. I think it's really important. Um, and if you are in charge of your finances, you know, you're unstoppable, right? Because you're not waiting for someone to do something for you. Like real estate investing, actually my boyfriend at the time, he said something to me once, like he was worried I was going to come to him for money if something went wrong with the units. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's insulting. And, you yeah. know, anyway, I, I never did. And I've been fine. There were months where it was really, really tough. And I remember one tenant I had in Raleigh, she would always pay the rent really late. And a property manager said, well, she's a single mother. And I said, well, so am I. <laughs> My kids want Christmas presents this year too, right? And it's like, no excuses, just, you know, exactly. go on your destiny. And if real estate is something you want to try, I think it's an excellent thing to do. And it's, I mean, it's a time-tested way to build wealth. For sure. It is. Absolutely yeah. is. Nancy, thank you so much. Oh, it's been welcome. a real pleasure. How can people reach you? Do you, do you like... Um, are you open to people reaching out to you and oh, asking absolutely. questions or I have a website, nancy-mckenna.com and I'm creating a little PDF for people that maybe want to get into real estate, but in a sort of real estate adjacent way. So there's different ways you can participate without directly owning property. So there's, you can go to nancy-mckenna.com forward slash real estate.
Excellent. And I have a new Insta account and it's Ms. Nancy McKenna. And you can follow me there for lots of personal finance, um, empowerment sort of things for midlife women. And yeah, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Excellent. Thanks, Nancy. And we'll put all those links in the show notes. Great. You're awesome. You're fantastic. <laughs> I, and an inspiration. I love you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, listener, for listening. We really appreciate you. And now it's up to you to think of who you want to forward this this podcast to, who else needs to hear these messages, what single person is uh, thinking, oh, well, I'm just a single woman. What can I do by myself? Allow Nancy to tell Very, you that. Right. And right. me too. I'm a single person also. So Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Absolutely. Well, thank and, you so much. Yes. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye.